Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our class today on this course, PC213. On the end times, thank you for connecting to the class. Um, let's take a moment to pray together and we'll get started. Could somebody please lead us in prayer and then we will um, get started. Anybody could unmute your mic and uh, please pray with us. Yeah. Can I pray, pray Pastor? God, God, even us. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time and moment that you have given us, Lord Jesus. This morning, Father God, we choose to praise you, we choose to worship you, Jesus, that who you are and what you does, Lord Jesus. Yes, Father God, as we are moving forward this day, Lord Jesus, and whatever we are going to learn, Father God, help us to understand, Father God. Help us to learn and recognize the deeper things, Father God. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead us and to guide us and to teach us. We submit Pastor Asis into your mighty hand, and we submit all the students into your mighty hand. And we ask this pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Vinas. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Once again, uh, we are um, uh, in the course. We are currently uh, going through or doing a panoramic view of the sequence of events. And... Um, we kind of transitioned from our notes uh, PDF document, we kind of transitioned into the book of Revelation. So we're basically using um, the book of Revelation as um, an outline uh, to give us the chronology of events that will take place. So what we have established thus far is um, um, subsequent to the rapture of the church, uh, we, as we entered into the book of Revelation, we said um, chapters four and five, which we looked at last week, are giving us a, a picture of what is happening in heaven um, right after the rapture of the church. We said that as we see these 24 elders are seated around the throne of God. Uh, we see the, um, the Lamb of God. We see the Holy Spirit uh, in the throne room. Uh, we see the 24 elders. We see the angelic beings, and they're all uh, worshiping, uh, worshiping God, the angelic beings, the 24 elders. And then we see the Lamb of God coming forth to open the seals. He starts, um, uh, he takes a scroll to open the seals. That means from now on, these things are going to start being fulfilled. So that is the beginning of Revelation chapter six, um, which we said is the starting point of the seven year tribulation here on earth. So Revelation six one, the opening of the first seal is indicating the beginning of the tribulation. And just to quickly review Revelation chapter 6, it begins with four horses, indicating now, uh, like we said, some of these things are literal, some of these things are figurative or symbolic. And these four horses are symbolic. They are depicting to us things that move with strength or things that happen with strength and speed. So in Revelation 6, 1, when the first seal is open, there is uh, the white horse um, and um, uh, the person on it goes out conquering and conquer. So, uh, this, so this is talking to us about the Antichrist. It's not Christ. Christ comes riding on a white horse in Revelation 19. But this is a copy, an anti-Christ. He's not the real Christ. But he comes pretending like that. And he gains power over the nations. Revelation 6, verse, verse 1. Um, and then we are seeing that uh, as these 
each seal is being opened, uh, we see all kinds of calamities happening on earth. The second, this is Revelation 6, uh, 3, there's war. That's the second seal. The third seal talks about famine. The fourth seal talks about uh, death, uh, destroying a fourth of the earth, 25% of the earth's population is destroyed. Uh, fifth seal is talking to us about martyrs, uh, those who have been slain uh, during the tribulation uh, for the word of God. Right? That is Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. So there are a lot, a lot of people are going to be dying right from the beginning of the tribulation for their faith in Christ, for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And then the sixth seal, uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, um, is talking about these uh, cosmic events. And the, uh, 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 the sun becoming black, the moon becoming like blood. There are stars of heaven falling to the earth. These could be like meteors and other things that's just dropping onto the earth. And so uh, that's, that's great calamity. That's the sixth seal. So we stopped there last week at the end of Revelation chapter 6. We just see looking at the sequence of events. At right? the beginning of the tribulation, here are the things that are happening on earth uh, as the seals are being opened. So uh, we're going to move forward from there. Any questions up until this point? That is um, end of Revelation um, chapter 6. So we're just getting an overview. So we're moving very fast. We're not going into every verse um, that we will do next year. But um, yeah, here, right now, we're just getting an uh, overview of the sequence of events. Any questions at this point? Okay. So let's begin today with Revelation chapter 7. Right, so the seals, um, the, the seven seals, which are seven judgments being poured out, have started happening here on the earth. And at that time in Revelation chapter seven, what we see is that God marks out 144,000 Jews. They've been marked. Now the seal, uh, that is put, when you look at the New Testament context, the seal uh, represents the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the mark of the Holy Spirit, and also the name of God put upon our lives. So we as believers are sealed uh, by the Holy Spirit and by the name of God that we carry. We name the name of Christ. So in Revelation 7, there are 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe who are marked out by God. Now, it doesn't tell us that all these 144,000 Jews are in Israel. It says they're Jews, but they could be scattered all over the world. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that these 144,000 Jews are living in Israel. They could be anywhere. Like we know that uh, the Jews are uh, dispersed in various parts of the world. Primarily, if you look at it, of course, the majority of the Jewish people are in uh, Israel, but then a great number are in North America. Uh, and, uh, and then you have a few uh, around Europe and maybe some other parts of the world. But the majority are in Israel or in North, North America, Canada, and US. So uh, they are dispersed in, in different places. 144,000 um, of these people are marked by God. And uh, what we know when we look at it later, that is when we look at Revelation 14, is that these people have been uh, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and they have been they are servants of the Lord. They may say proclaiming Jesus Christ. So um, you may hear uh, these 144,000 people who are marked Jews, who are marked by God. They are sometimes referred to as the Jewish evangelists. Right? So they are marked by God to bear testimony 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will, um, you will see, I mean, if you want to skip ahead, uh, uh, you know, if you go into Revelation 14, uh, you will find that um, they were, uh, Revelation 14, 1 to uh, 4, you'll find that, or 1 to 5, you'll find that they follow the Lamb of God. These were people uh, who follow the Lamb of God and uh, Revelation 14, 1 to 4, and there was no deceit found in their mouth. Um, so uh, in some way, they are giving testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ as they follow him. So they're referred to as the 144 Jewish evangelists. So that's the first part of the first thing we see in Revelation chapter 7. Then the second part of Revelation 7 gives us a glimpse of a great multitude of people standing before the throne of God and worshiping. That's Revelation 7, 9 to 17. And so you see this great multitude of people and they're all clothed in white robes and they're worshiping God. And so uh, John uh, is asked by one of the elders, this is Revelation 7, 13, he says, you know, do you know who these people are? And uh, the apostle John says, sir, you know, you would know, I don't know. And then the elder tells him, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, uh, these are the ones who've come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So there's a big question here saying, how did these people, this great multitude of people from every nation, tribe and tongue, who are, uh, you know, are standing before the throne, how did they get there to heaven? We know it says here in verse 14, Revelation 7, 14, they, they have come out of the great tribulation. That means during the tribulation, these people have come into heaven. And when we said these people, meaning their spiritual bodies, not the physical bodies. Um, we don't know that physically they are there, but we know spiritually they are there. And they are dressed in white robes. Uh, they are in heaven. We don't know, it doesn't tell us here, how did all of these people come to heaven? They came out of the tribulation. How did they come to heaven? Now, here's what I want to, you know, I want you to, I want to put before you that in the book of Revelation, there are three passages. There are three passages that give us a picture of heaven where there are people worshipping before the throne of God. One of them, one of those passages is right here, Revelation 7, 9 to 17. You, there's, there's one, you know, look into heaven and you see this great multitude of people worshipping before God. The other one is what we just mentioned, Revelation 14, 1 to 5. And in that section of scripture, we find the 144,000 Jews are worshiping before the throne of God. The other singing the song, uh, singing before the throne of God and worshiping the Lamb of God. And the third picture that we, uh, third passage of scripture is in Revelation 15, 1 to 4. But again, you know, you see, um, uh, a sea of glass, Revelation 15, 1 to 4. And there are people who are standing there uh, who have refused to take the mark of the beast. Uh, they refused to get his name, take his number, and they are standing and worshiping God. Okay, so what did we say? In the book of Revelation, as we're journeying through the seven year tribulation, that is between Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 19, right? That's the tribulation period. We are given three glimpses into heaven where we are seeing multitudes of people standing before the throne of God and worshiping. Revelation 7, which we just uh, 
considering now. There's a great multitude. And we are told they have come out of the tribulation. They are before the throne. Revelation 14, it's the 144,000 Jews. I mean, these, these 144,000 people who have who've been sealed by the Holy Spirit in Revelation 7, they are there before the throne of God. And then Revelation 15, we again see more, more people standing before the throne of God. And these are people who refuse to take the mark of the beast and they are there in heaven worshiping God. So the question is, how did all these people, you know, how do they uh, uh, come, how do they get there? What I also want to point out is that during this tribulation period, that is between Revelation 6 to Revelation 19, there are at least three passages that are telling us that people are being killed for their faith. So one is um, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, uh, which we just saw a little earlier. Uh, these are people who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony uh, which they held. Then again in uh, Revelation 13 and uh, Revelation 13 and verse 15, uh, uh, it's uh, telling us that uh, as many as would not worship the image of the beast were killed. Revelation 13, 15. So people are being killed who refuse to worship. Then again in Revelation 14 and verse 13, it says, Blessed are those are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So there are people during the tribulation who are dying in the Lord. So it is most likely that these three pictures of um, great multitudes or the 144,000 or the other great multitude in Revelation 15 who are standing before the throne of God in white robes, worshiping God, it's most likely, and I'm, I'm not saying we can state this conclusively, but we are stating it based on the fact that repeatedly we are seeing people are being killed for their faith during the tribulation for refusing to take the mark of the beast. So what we are saying is, or what we can infer or conclude very logically is that these people that we are seeing up in heaven worshiping are people we can refer to as the tribulation martyrs, people who are killed during the tribulation. They're dying, they're dead, but we are seeing that they are their spirits are up in heaven worshiping God, most likely. That's what it is. Now, when we come to Revelation 14, there is the possibility because of the text used in the in Revelation 14, that the 144,000 Jews could be have, could have been resurrected. Could be, because there it specifically says they were redeemed from the earth and were the first fruits. So the word first fruits uh, is usually used in the New Testament to refer to physical resurrection or to being born again spiritually. So because of that, and again, we cannot prove, say it conclusively, but because of that, we think that perhaps the 144,000 Jews were resurrected. Um, in the, you know, after they were killed, they were resurrected and they were taken up into heaven, perhaps, because it says they were the first fruits, uh, resurrection. But uh, I just want us to un uh, understand that during the tribulation, Revelation 6 to Revelation 19, we have three visions of heaven where there are people who have come out of the tribulation worshiping God. And there are at least three mentions here on earth that people are being killed for their faith in Christ. And therefore we are saying that these multitudes we are seeing come up into heaven are uh, base uh, are people who have been killed during the tribulation. So I see a question here. Uh, uh, 
from Beth, the uh, asking about the 144,000 Jews, uh, are they all uh, male uh, based on Revelation 14, 4? And the answer is yes. Right? So um, for, for whatever reason, uh, God has chosen them. And uh, uh, they are the ones who are not defiled with women. So Revelation 14, 4 says that. So uh, we say that these 144,000 Jews are men. Um, based on what we see in Revelation 14.4. Okay, so just a quick recap. Revelation 6, the tribulation has begun. Those seals have been opened. After the sixth seal, we are seeing that there are 144,000 Jews who are marked by the Holy Spirit. And then we're also seeing a vision into heaven where there's so many people who have come out of the tribulation and they are worshiping God. And what we are saying is it's very likely these are the people who have died during the, who have been killed for their faith um, during the tribulation. And they are, there's the spirits are coming up before the throne of God, worshiping God. We come into the seventh uh, chapter eight, Revelation. So we're kind of progressing chronologically. What do we see next? This is the seventh seal. When the seventh seal is open, there's silence in heaven. And it is the, it is the sign to start off the seven trumpets. So it's like the seven seals. Uh, the seventh seal is the beginning for the next set of seven judgments, which are the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet is the beginning of the last, you know, it's the beginning. It says, okay, now they got to start the last set, which is our seven bowls of judgment, right? So. To kind of connect with each other like that. So when we come into chapter eight, um, they're getting the angels are getting ready to um, blow the seven trumpets. But what we are seeing, this is Revelation eight verses one to five, is there is prayer incense rising up before the throne of God. So Revelation eight verses one to five. And so we can say that at this point in time, there's a lot of prayer happening. It's almost like a prayer revival from earth. That means things are bad. Things are very bad. Unlike what has the earth has ever witnessed before. Great numbers of people are dying for the faith in Christ, being killed for the faith in Christ. But it's also giving rise to uh, I'm just using the word prayer revival because we're seeing there's much incense. It's the prayers of the saints that are ascending before the throne of God. So people are praying. This, they're turning, you know, there, there is a good, uh, uh, there is a huge turning towards God. People are crying out to God. There's prayers ascending before the throne of God and the angel of God is taking a censer and throwing it from the altar onto the earth uh, symbolizing that God himself is um, um, you know increasing the fire of this prayer revival. You know, God is accepting these prayers that are coming forth from the earth and, uh, and, and, you know, and adding fire to this prayers that are sending. So there are people who are crying out to God, turning to God. So that's something to make note of. There's a prayer revival happening from the earth during the tribulation, which is also very logical. That is, there will be people who, after seeing all this, and then coming to understand that, hey, this is what, you know, these Christians have been talking to us about all along. And here it is happening. There will be a turning to God and a crying out to God and a praying, you know, to God, which is which is also very very logical. Revelation chapter eight onwards, we see the seven trumpets. So each angel is blowing a trumpet, and when a trumpet is blown, something happens. And if you just follow with me. Revelation 8 verse 7, 
when the first angel sounds, a, um, there is hail and fire, and a third of the vegetation, one third, or thirty percent of Earth's vegetation is destroyed. Uh, so there has to, and it's through hail and fire. Okay, so that means it's this. There must be huge fire, forest fires, blaze fires that are resulting in the destruction of Earth's vegetation. Second trumpet, Revelation 8, 8. It says, you see something like a great, great mountain burning with fire and being thrown into the sea. And one third of the sea became blood. Now, back in the time of John, he probably didn't, I, I, I don't know for sure, but when you see a great mountain burning with fire, what do you think of? A mountain burning with fire, things that are being thrown into the sea. What, what do you think of? Yeah, you think of a volcano, right? Yeah, see the BS uh, text message there. So it's most likely Revelation 8, 8, maybe John is saying that, you know, there's like a mountain throwing stuff off with fire, throwing it into the sea. And uh, a third of the sea became blood. So we look, we th most likely that's what he is saying. And the living creatures and ships on the sea are destroyed. So it could be volcanic eruptions of a huge magnitude scale that is uh, causing devastation of uh, sea creatures and, and ships and other things uh, on the sea. Verse 10 says, he sees a great star fall from heaven burning like a torch and it destroys the rivers and the water and the waters become affected and uh, uh, it becomes bitter and people die. So verse 10 and 11. So something falls from the heavens onto the earth. We don't know. Yeah, you know, some planetary body, whether it's an asteroid or something, is something it strikes the earth and it affects the waters and many people die. Fourth angel, this is verse 12. The sun, Revelation 8 to 12, the sun is struck and the moon and the stars and they become dark. And the third, third of the day did not shine and likewise the night. So, you know, one third uh, of the day is darkened. So instead of a typical, you know, say, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness, you're, you're having uh, maybe 16 hours or more when the earth is darkened and um, a third of the day and did not shine. So if that happens, and we don't know how long this is held like that, it's going to really affect weather and perhaps even on a long term, the climate. But it's talking about the sun and the moon becoming dark, lone light coming through. And uh, it, of course, is going to affect life on Earth. Chapter 9, when the fifth angel sounds, there is um, released onto the Earth and, and, and John sees it like this. He sees like locusts and scorpions coming on the earth. That's Revelation 9 verse 3. And they are affecting people, except for these 144,000 Jews, the people who have the seal of God or the seal of God on their foreheads. So it's affecting all people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And people are being tormented by these locusts and scorpions for five months. 
And it says in verse 6, Revelation 9, 6, that men will seek death. They will desire to die. And they will, you know, and, and they will they will desire to die. They want to die because of the way they are, they are, they are being afflicted. And, uh, but they, you know, death evades them. And uh, we don't know what, what these locusts are, but he describes them in verse 7. They're like horses. They have crowns of something like coal on the head, and the face of the face of man. They have hair, they have teeth, and uh, they had uh, iron, and the sound of the wings, the sound of chariots, and their tail like scorpions, and the power was to hurt men for five months. Right? And uh, it says then, verse 11, they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, um, whose name in Hebrew was Abaddon and in the Greek was Apollyon. So it's most likely that there is an unleash of demonic spirits that are affecting man. So you look at Revelation 9, which is, read the whole passage, verses 1 to 11, uh, when the swift angel sounds, it's like literally all hell broke loose. That means there are these spirits coming out of the bottomless pit. They're afflicting man for a period of five months. The torment is so great, it says men want to die. They are so afflicted, but they cannot die. And they're hurting people for these five months. Um, it could be possibly, but all kinds of physical maladies, or because it talks about their their sting, that sting in their tails, uh, so on. So we don't know, you know, literally, literally how this is going to play out. But most likely, people are going to be so affected. Um, this is the fifth angel sounding the trumpet. Then, the sixth one, Revelation chapter nine, the sixth angel. And he, say, uh, he says here, the, uh, the, there are four angels that are released from the river Euphrates, and they are killing a third of mankind, Revelation 9, verse 15. And a third of mankind are killed. And then he sees an army of horsemen, 200 million. Who, um, uh, who uh, it says there, verse 17, I see them, at their breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. He says, and by these three plagues, A third of mankind was killed. This is verse 18, Revelation 9, 18. A third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power was in their mouth and in their tails. And um, smoke and brimstone. So, this, the sixth angel is, is talking about, and, and we don't know exactly what it is. Uh, John is saying this army of people, uh, army that's moving in. First of all, the angels are killing a third of mankind. And then this, this strange army that's moving in and um, that's uh, releasing fire, smoke, and brimstone. It could be. You know, and I, I'm just using my imagination here. Yeah, this is not, uh, you know, scriptural or anything, but it could be, he, he could be seeing, you know, um, uh, uh, an army of tanks and uh, a military moving across, but uh, releasing smoke and brimstone. You know, it could be fire and all kinds of destruction being released. Um, it could be, you know, uh, 
missiles that are flying across because he's talking about uh, power in the mouth and the tails, tails like serpents, uh, and and having heads with which uh, they do harm. And there is smoke and brimstone, fire, smoke and brimstone, now red and yellow like sulfur. So it could be. I'm not saying it is, but it could be because if we think in modern terms, you know, and an, an, an army with tanks and um, uh, missiles and all those kinds of destructive things, uh, if those things are released on the earth, you know, that's what you look at. You'll see smoke and brimstone and fire and um, great destruction. But lots of people are being killed. Saying 30, one third of mankind is killed. Again, another one third of mankind is killed by what this destructive army causes. Right? So I'm just imagining it could be a destructive army, or it could be just something else, but there's a loss of a huge number of human lives. This is the sixth angel that is sounding. So what we are seeing is in the seven trumpets, there are catastrophic weather conditions. There are demonic spirits. And then what could have could be uh, a military conflict, invasion, people fighting, could be. All resulting in the loss of human life. That means things are bad. The giant, God's judgment is being poured out on the earth. But what is very strange in Revelation 9, the way it ends is this. In Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21. So Revelation 8, we saw there's a lot of prayer rising. But Revelation 9, 20, 21, we are seeing that people still don't repent. You look at this in Revelation 9, 20, 21, it says, but the rest of the mankind who are not killed by these plagues did not repent. And they continued worshipping demons and idols. And they, verse 21, they did not repent of their murders, sorceries, immorality, and so on. So it's very strange that on the one hand, there will be prayer rising, that's Revelation 8, first part. Revelation 9, there's also people who are just rejecting and saying, no, I don't want God. I don't want, you know, I don't want to turn to God. So you've got both happening during the tribulation. You've got people turning to God, crying out to God. You also have people who refuse to repent and say, I will not. I will continue in my own ways. I'm not turning to the God of the Bible. You have that also happening. Is everyone with me so far? Anybody you got left somewhere in the tribulation? I'm just joking. Okay. You all with me till Revelation chapter 9. Okay. We're just looking at the sequence of events. Okay. So... Revelation chapter 10 uh, is like a parenthetical chapter. That means uh, it's just telling us uh, a little, it's like a side note. So in Revelation 10, uh, a mighty angel appears to John and he makes him eat a book. Yeah, so let's take a little book. I'm just summarizing chapter 10, I'm not going into all the details. But he tells me, you know, you need to eat this book because you have to prophesy some more. So uh, it's kind of a, par a parenthetical chapter. John has this personal experience. He sees this big angel and um, he's got this book and he tells John to eat it. Now, this is very much similar to, you know, what uh, Ezekiel experienced when God told him to eat a scroll so that he can prophesy. It's, it's just figurative. It's just, um, uh, uh, what to say, it's a prophetic image, meaning uh, there's more that you have to uh, 
uh, that I want to speak through you. I'm going to give you more words and you have to speak more. So Revelation 10 is a, a little chapter like that. And um, the angel um, tells John, you know, eat this book. And uh, uh, it's interesting. It says in Revelation 10, 10 when John ate it, um, uh, it, initially it was sweet as honey, but then it became bitter in his stomach because he's going to prophesy not sweet things. Sorry, verse 11, he says, uh, Revelation 10, 11, you must prophesy about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. I mean, there's more things you're going to be unveiling or speaking about. And um, in this chapter, Revelation 10, and in verse 7, the angel says, look, there's one more trumpet to be sounded. So you know, we've gone through six trumpets. Things have happened already on the earth. There's still one more to be sounded. And when that sounds, that's telling you time has come to wrap things up. I'm just paraphrasing Revelation 10, verse 7. That means all the things that God has spoken through his prophets all along, it's, it's all being brought together. So you know, there's one more trumpet to be sounded. And so when the seventh trumpet sounds, it's the beginning of the last set of woes, um, the seven bowls. And with that, everything's going to be wrapped up. So this angel tells John these two things main, mainly. Seventh trumpet, it's the finale. It's the final thing that's going to, it's going to fulfill whatever the prophets have spoken. Things are going to get wrapped up. And also here, eat this book. That's more that you're going to unveil, more you're going to prophesy. So it's a parenthetical chapter that John has this experience, Revelation 10. So he's getting ready to prophesy more. So we've come along all this way. And then Revelation 11, and very interestingly, Revelation 11 now gives us the timeline where we are in the seven years. We started in Revelation 6, verse 1. We've gone through the seven seals of judgment. We've gone through six of the trumpets. And we're wondering, okay, how far into the tribulation are we? Revelation 11 gives us the answer because in Revelation 11, he says, there are 42 months left. 42 months. So that tells us Revelation 11 is the midpoint of the tribulation. And it's logical because uh, from Revelation 11, uh, sorry, Revelation 11 onwards, we see details about the Antichrist changing as a person. Revelation 6, 1 introduced him as the man on a white horse. He's just extending his influence over the nations. That means he's coming as a man of peace and he's gaining influence. From Revelation 11 onwards, we will see, you know, when we come to Revelation 13, we'll see this man is completely changed. He's now demanding to be worshipped. Very different. Okay. And so we understand, okay, Revelation 11, we're in the midpoint of the Revelation. So it says Revelation 1, you know, it says, okay, uh, it starts over the temple of God. Uh, the angel is, is measuring the temple. So this is why Revelation 11, 1, is why one of the main reason why we say um, there has to be a third temple. Right? There has to be a third temple built uh, where, where at the moment there is no temple. Because uh, it is in this temple that um, uh, sacrifices would be offered initially during the first three and a half years. And then in the next three and a half years or 42 months, uh, it's going to be desecrated. And the Gentiles are going to desecrate it. And uh, they're going to trample it underfoot. And the Antichrist is going to set himself up in that temple. So that's why we are saying there has to be a physical temple uh, not just, you know, uh, a spiritual thing. So Revelation 1 says, you know, uh, Revelation 1 and 2 says, 
Okay, you measure the temple. I mean, this is God's holy place. God's personally interested in it. And, but leave out the temple, or uh, you know, the court uh, outside the temple, uh, because the Gentiles are going to tread this place for 42 months. 42 months. And then verse 3 is, it tells us something. Suddenly it introduces us to two witnesses. And they are going to be on the earth 1,260 days. That means that three and a half year period or that 42 months, they are going to be here on the earth. So again, it gives us a timeline on when the two witnesses are coming in on the scene in the middle of the tribulation. Now, it doesn't tell us who these two witnesses are. So we have to you know, consider other portions of the Bible. And what we do know is in Malachi 4, God said, I will send Elijah before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So it's okay. So one of them is Elijah. And then we have to think about who could be the other person. And so there is obviously a, a, a different, uh, what to say, possibilities. It could be Enoch. Uh, be, and one reasoning is because Enoch was taken up into heaven without dying. Or it could be Moses. And the reasoning for that is because both Elijah and Moses were seen on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we don't know for sure. If I were to, if I were to take a guess, uh, I would think maybe it's Enoch. Uh, uh, but again, it's only a guess. It's, we don't know for sure. But we do know Elijah for sure because his name has been mentioned. So there are these two witnesses. And uh, Revelation 11 takes us from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation. And just tells us from the middle till the end, this is what the two witnesses would be doing. Okay. So it tells us that um, they're going to do, uh, um, uh, so, you know, when they speak, they're very, it's like fire proceeding. This is Revelation 11, 5. When they speak, it's like fire coming to the mouth. Uh, they have the power to stop the rain, the heavens. And that's very much like what Elijah did in his ministry. Uh, they are able to strike the earth and so on. And then it tells us here that the beast, um, uh, that is, so now it introduces the term the beast. And we will find later that the beast refers to the Antichrist. But Revelation 11, 7 just introduces that term, the beast. So the Antichrist who is empowered by Satan, he uh, makes war with them and kills them. So that means he, he comes out against them and he kills these two witnesses. When? Uh, towards the end of the second half of the tribulation. Uh, um, and uh, they, will, they will be there. Right? And verse 8 says, their dead bodies will lie in the great city, that is, uh, the city of Jerusalem, and uh, spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So it's very interesting, you know, in Revelation eleven eight, that the city of Jerusalem is referred to spiritually as Sodom and Egypt. Why? Because by this time, the city spiritually has gone away from God. It's in a bad state spiritually. Right? So this great city where our Lord was crucified, Revelation 11, 8, that is of course the city of Jerusalem. Spiritually it's referred to as Sodom and Egypt. It's gone away from God, worshipping of our, uh, the wrong gods. Egypt talks about idolatry. Sodom talks about the immorality. And so the, spiritually, the city has departed away from God. And uh, these men, 
these two witnesses, well, their bodies will be lying in the street in Jerusalem. And uh, verse 9 says, People from tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days, and their bodies will not be put in the grave. Now, you think about it. Some of the things, and this is something I want to just point out here, is that some of the things that we see mentioned in the book of Revelation could only be fulfilled in the time that we are living in. If you go back in time, say, 30 or 40 years, Revelation 11, 9, it could not be, could not be fulfilled. But the time we are living in, it says people, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days. And the times that we are living in, of course, it can happen because of, yeah, in the internet and, and the technology we have. You know, what is happening there in the city of Jerusalem? Two people lying dead on the street in the city of Jerusalem immediately can be viewed from everywhere in the world. It says tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies. So if you go back in time, you know, just I'm just saying, okay, just... I mean, maybe even 20 years ago, but definitely 30 years ago before the internet came in, that, you know, how are you going to see it? I mean, maybe through some television, but television at that time was not necessarily covering the whole earth. But here we are today, the whole world, or almost the whole world is fully connected. You know, maybe some remote places may not, but otherwise, for the better part, the whole world is connected. And Revelation 11, 9 can literally be fulfilled. But John wrote. Now, when John was writing, it was an impossibility. It was nowhere close that the whole world could see the dead bodies of two people who were lying in Jerusalem. That just wasn't possible. But he wrote it down. Those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days, and they will not put them in the grave. I mean, they won't just, you know, let them suffer, you know, like as though the bodies be there. Right. And um, Abbas 10 says, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice. They'll be celebrating that these two prophets have been uh, killed. But then it says, verse 11, after three and a half days, they're going to rise up. They'll stand on their feet and great fear will fall on them. And there, there'll be this voice, loud voice from heaven, come up here and they will ascend into the clouds and their enemies will see them. So this will be a very powerful sign to the whole world. The whole world is watching. And this is going to happen. So, so this is going from middle of tribulation to end of tribulation. Okay. So two, these two witnesses for 42 months, 1,260 days uh, from Revelation 11 till the end of the tribulation, they're going to be, you know, bearing witness. Towards the end of the tribulation, the beast, the Antichrist is going to kill them. The world is going to see all of this. And before their eyes, they're going to, after three and a half days, they're going to be raised up and they're going to ascend to heaven. The whole world's going to see. That's at the end of that 1,260 days. That means three and a half years or 42 months, end of the tribulation. Okay. Uh, I'll quickly answer Elisha's question and then we go for a break. Um, question from Elisha. Are the two witnesses going to come in the spirit of Elijah or as Elijah? Um from what we know, we know uh, we know that uh, Elijah will come. Why? Because Malachi four says, "I will send you Elijah the prophet." When John the Baptist came, 
And we know John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 17, Elijah has come and indeed will come. Matthew 17. So what Jesus was recognizing there in uh, Matthew, uh, let me give you the exact verse. Um, uh, um, Matthew 17, 11 and 12, right? So Matthew 17, 11 and 12. So Elijah will co is coming, but I said to you, Elijah has already come. In what sense? So it was John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But the actual man, Elijah, will come. So Jesus, Elijah is coming. That's the Elijah we're going to see in uh, Revelation 11, right? Uh, so. pa pa Hello, Pastor, can I ask a follow-up question on that, please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, does that mean that then uh, we, we should believe in reincarnation? Because if Elijah is going to come, the person Elijah is going to come, then it's possible uh, reincarnation is, is, is something that uh, Christians must believe in. Is that the case, please? Uh, not, not needed, because uh, reincarnation means a person lives, dies, and is born again, born physically again into the earth. In the case of Elijah and Enoch, they did not die, right? So, so reincarnation doesn't apply. Uh, they lived on the earth and they were taken up into heaven bodily. These are the only two people who were taken up bodily without dying into heaven directly, transported. So these two people, they haven't died. So reincarnation does not apply. And they could be bodily dropped back on the earth. You know, so it's not that they're going to be born back into the earth as babies, but they could be dropped back into the earth just as they were bodily taken up into heaven. They could be bodily released back on the earth. All right. Thank you very much, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. It's clear. Okay. Say you had a question. Yeah, go ahead, say. Yeah, it was kind of related to what he, he just asked, but I was just wondering that for Elijah, yes, he was bodily translated to heaven, but Moses died. So I'm still trying to reconcile um, where it says that it's appointed for every man to die once, and after that, that will be judgment. So I don't know, where does Moses now come if he's going to be showing up with Elijah um, hmm. during the tribulation yeah, period? So yeah, so so that's the reason, you know, again, this is only my my opinion is, okay, it's going to be Enoch and Elijah for this very reason that Enoch didn't die physically. That these were the only two people who didn't die physically. Uh, both of them were taken up bodily into heaven. Uh, but then there are some who, I mean, as you, you listen to different people, there were some who would say, well, it, it's Moses because he was there in the Mount of Transfiguration. But then, you know, you could have this argument say, but Moses died. So um, why would God send him back? You know, so we could. Uh, so, uh, but the thing is, we don't want to fight over it because, um, you know, whoever God sends, he's going to send. There'll be two witnesses. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And you don't think, sir, it can be the possibility of someone coming in the spirit of Elijah? If if John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, wouldn't it also be... No, but, okay, I think I get what you're saying now. Okay, no worries. Mm. I, I think I get what you're saying. Mm. They weren't born, just came like that, right? That's what we're saying. Yeah. They weren't born into... They only just came physically into the earth. So, okay, okay, I think I understand yeah. what you're saying. 
Yeah. Thank because you. if God, yeah, if God could take them physically up into heaven, He can drop them back physically to the earth, right? I mean, that's just, true. Yeah. All right. So, okay. Um, um, okay. So what we'll do is we'll take a break, and then we'll come back, and we will pick up the other two questions. I see two more questions in the chat, but let's take a break, and we'll be right back. Uh, we'll be back in ten minutes. We'll pick up these questions and then move forward. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 